All right. So we are here in Matthew chapter 9 this morning, and uh, we are uh, covering yet a couple other miracles that Jesus, um, uh, we see, will be performing uh, by healing some folks here. And he has been doing that uh, for several chapters in our, in our uh, preaching and, and studying time here, and all to show that he is God, that he is, he is God in the flesh. And so this morning, uh, we'll be in chapter, our chapter 9, starting in verse 27. We will go all the way through verse 34 this morning um, in our reading. Uh, so uh, if you would, out of respect for the reading of God's Word, would you stand with me, please? And we'll start in verse 27. I will read out loud, and if you would follow along uh, silently, that would be great. And we will get right into it here right away. So starting in verse 27. When Jesus departed thence, two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. And when he was come into the house, the blind men came to him. And Jesus said unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this? And they said unto him, Yea, Lord. Then touched he their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it unto you. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus straightly charged them, saying, See that no man know it. But they, when they were departed, spread abroad his fame in all that country. And as they went out, behold, they brought to him a dumb man possessed with a devil. And when the devil was cast out, the dumb spake, and the multitudes marveled, saying, It was never so seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, He casteth out devils, through the prince of devils. Powerful passage. Let's pray and ask God to bless as we get into this message this morning. Father, thank you for your word. More now than ever, we need you. We're thankful that you allow us to meet in your presence this morning, that you are here with us. We are here with you, actually. And we just thank you for your infallible, eternal, inerrant word that you have preserved for us so that we can have the absolute authority uh, on truth for our faith and our practice. We thank you for all these things. Thank you for Jesus dying on the cross, being buried and, and rising again. Lord, we're just here this morning needing you to work in our lives in a powerful way, in a big way, in a very thorough way. I'm praying and asking you speak to us each individually right where we are in our lives with everything that's going on and I ask that you speak to us corporately as a body of believers as a church your body and I pray this morning that you would show us what you know about these passages give us your insight and your understanding reveal to us what you need each of us to know and I pray that out of that we would submit to what you Show us that we'd be receptive, that we would be built up in the faith, uh, that we would glorify you and lift up your name. And if there's anybody here today, Father, that does not know you as their personal Savior, who may be depending on something else besides your grace through faith to be saved, I pray that today would be the day they'd come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you and be seated if you would please. So in this particular instance, if we recall what we've been reading uh, last week and the weeks before uh, when we were in this series here in Matthew, we understand that Jesus had been in uh, Matthew Levi's house and uh, he had gathered many publicans uh, to come and be guests where Jesus was the guest of honor at a very lavish meal, a feast that was put on in Jesus' honor. And he sat with them and was criticized of that, uh, for that, of being eating with publicans and sinners. And you recall, he answered that criticism with this statement. He said, they that behold need not a physician, but they that are sick. And so he went where the people were. He went where people had a need. He was not ashamed of that. Uh, that was why he came. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. 
So then why shouldn't he go to where the people were that needed him? That's a great example for all of us. While he was sitting in that house, still, a man by the name of Jairus, a ruler of the Jews, a ruler more specifically in the synagogue of the Jews there in Jerusalem, had come right into the house, right where Jesus was sitting, and told him of his daughter that was at the point of death. And Jesus, hearing that, immediately arose. His disciples followed him. It's obvious by reading the scriptures that we've read that many of the people in the house and perhaps those along the way followed him. And they were headed to Jairus' house when a woman approached Jesus and thinking in her mind after she had been dealing with an issue of blood for 12 long years consecutively. She reached out through the crowd, touched the garment of the Lord Jesus, and was healed immediately because she believed in her heart that he was the Messiah. And if only she could even touch the garment that he was wearing. Uh, she ended up touching the hem of the garment, but as she reached out, that's as far as she could reach, and, and she was healed. As they continued along the line, there's more details that we discussed last week, but as, she, as he continued along the road to Jairus' house, he had a servant of Jairus or somebody from within the house come out and tell him not to bother the master anymore, for his daughter was dead. They went into the house anyway. Jesus told the people who were there, and amongst the people that were there, they had already hired some minstrels, some musicians, some professional mourners that were weeping um, because they were getting paid to weep and getting paid to play funeral type um, uh, music. And Jesus put them forth and said, don't uh, weep anymore, don't mourn anymore because this maid, this young girl, this little girl, 12 years of age, was not dead but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. And of course he spoke of the sleep of death wherein a miracle would be performed shortly and she would rise from the dead. And that's exactly what happened. He put everybody out, save the mom and the dad of the little girl, and also uh, Peter, James, and John. He told this little girl, Talitha Kumai, which is to say, uh, little girl, arise. And he took her by the hand and she rose up and he commanded that uh, she would be given something to eat. He left that house and went out into the uh, street. And as he did, as he left Jairus' home, there were two blind men that approached him. They had to have had help, I'm guessing, to get close to him, to know exactly. They could hear but we don't have anything recorded here that Jesus was speaking at the moment. So they had to have had help to come right before him in his presence. And as they were led there, they cried out and they said, um, uh, excuse me, let me find my place. Thou son of David, have mercy on us. Now that's very significant. And we need to understand that it was Jesus coming from the line of David he would be a son of David in, in David's um, a genealogy, or his, in his gene pool here and in his line uh, and everything. He would be a relative of King David through his mother, primarily Mary, but his stepdad Joseph also was related to David uh, down his line as well. So when they said, thou son of David, when they addressed him like that, they were saying, we believe that you are the one and only Messiah that was prophesied in the Old Testament that would come through the line of David. We believe you are our savior. You're our deliverer. You're the one that was born and said he will be called Emmanuel, being God with us. We believe that you are God in the flesh. Hallelujah, glory to God. So this uh, reference from them addressing him as the son of David is very important. And as they recognized that, they cried out and said, have mercy on us. And 
it appears, it says that indeed he was not, they were not immediately healed. They were not immediately caused to see. There seems to be a little break of time, a little um, interlude there where Jesus and these blind men, these two blind men didn't have any uh, interaction, any conversation going on. I believe that as they approached Jesus, he turned to them, heard what they had to say, didn't say a word, and turned around and went into yet another house. Went from Matthew Levi's house to Jairus' house to yet another house. Unidentified as of yet in the scripture. He didn't heal them. They asked for mercy. They asked for healing. But he didn't heal them on the spot. He turned and went into the house. And when he was come into the house, verse 28 said, the blind men came to him again, I believe, with some help, with someone escorting them, maybe taking in each one of them uh, uh, by uh, their arms or hands or somehow a uh, hand on the shoulder and leading them, saying, come with me. Go forward here just a little bit closer. And as they approached Jesus this time, they didn't speak, but he spoke to them and said, Believe ye that I am able to do this. And they said to him, Yea, Lord. And the Bible says, And he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it unto you. And then the Bible says in verse 30, And their eyes were opened. So what's going on here? I believe that even though they did believe definitely that Jesus was the Messiah, he was their long-awaited Savior, God in the flesh. That He was testing their faith. That He just didn't answer their prayer the first time. And so that's a challenge to each of us to know and understand that faith in God is not simply asking one time and expecting an answer and if we don't get it, we just drop it and don't bring it up again. We don't bring it before the throne of grace again. Don't ask God again. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 7, if you recall when we were back there, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and everyone that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. But if you study out the verb tense there, and understand that when he said ask and it shall be given, it meant to ask and keep asking. It is listed in the same way for the verb seek, seek and keep seeking, and also the verb knock, knock and keep knocking. In the durative tense, just keep doing it. And so what we need to understand is as God said to pray without ceasing, because by the way, he's listening without ceasing. Amen. You know that? Night and day, 24-7. God is right there before the and on his throne and he's saying come boldly to the throne of grace that you may be able to obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. What a blessing that is and what a great promise from God that is. But that is forever for 24 hours a day. Quite often when we uh, are headed into a season of of approaching where we're approaching a revival meeting here at Albury First Baptist Church, we will often get out a list and have folks sign up for different hours of the day where uh, we will uh, be able to fill those slots and that our church literally, as a church family, is hoping to pray 24 hours a day for a revival. And so what we understand by that is that God is awake even at midnight, one, two, three, four in the morning, five, and, and everything. Some folks think that uh, uh, the sun does not come up gradually. It's just kind of there. When they wake up, it's always light and, and everything. But the sun does come up gradually. And God is in control of that sun, and He's in control of the rotation and, uh, um, and everything of the earth and the revolving of the earth around the sun, and he's holding that all in place. 
uh, very carefully and, and, and with his great power, his, uh, omnis his omnipotence and his omniscience. But what I'm trying to say is, is that he's awake 24-7. He's in control 24-7. He's omnipotent or infinite in his power 24-7. He is sovereign 24-7. He is holy and His greatness is unsearchable 24-7. So you can come to Him any time, night or day. But He said to ask and keep asking. Seek and keep seeking. Knock and keep knocking. So these two men, as they came to this point of asking Jesus for mercy that they might be healed, and He looks upon them and they can't necessarily tell that, but He turns away and walks into the house. Doesn't answer their prayer. But somebody ushered them into the house where Jesus was. Somebody also, along with these two blind men, would not give up. And somebody helped them. It's not said here, but believe me, uh, I believe when we get to heaven and if we were to ask Jesus about it, uh, we would know that somebody ushered them in. So it's not just we that should not give up praying, but that when we intercede on behalf of other people, we should not give up either. I recall that many years ago, when God got a hold of my heart and saved me and on the island of Okinawa, one of the very first things that happened in my heart was to realize that my family was not saved. That they did not know Jesus as Savior. They didn't know about this wonderful truth that you could have your sins forgiven and be guaranteed heaven. That you could know God personally through Jesus. That you could actually have a personal relationship with Him. This is thrilling. This is awesome. This is like the best thing that ever happened. It's the best deal anybody was ever offered. And right about that time, God's people should be saying, Amen, Hallelujah, Glory to God, preacher. Park there a while. Keep it going, you know. Ring that bell again, preacher. You know, something. Uh, but that's an exciting truth, ladies and gentlemen. That's a powerful truth. And so, but I started telling people about Jesus around me. I started sharing Christ with them. Didn't know what a gospel track was, but I had my Bible. So that's all I could use. But it, 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 as I'm saying this, I, one of the things I did too is I wrote back home and sent gospel tracts to my family, various family members. One of them was my grandmother who had been involved in a cult for like 20 plus, 25 plus years at that point. And so I began to write her, and she didn't write me back, but she had my uncle who was involved in the same cult write me back. And I began to pray for each one of my family members by name on a daily basis, sometimes more than one time a day. I began to be really burdened for their souls and their uh, salvation, uh, so on and so forth. And as I got back from uh, Okinawa, Japan, and I got back to California, I began to visit them and uh, share Christ with them. My grandmother, she was so stubborn and so hard. She just, like a pit bull, had her uh, jaw teeth just, you know, gripping um, that cult false doctrine um, that the Kingdom Hall was putting out. And uh, she wouldn't let go, wouldn't listen. But little by little, I began to see little signs, uh, positive signs, where she would begin to ask me, do you sing the old songs in your church, Larry? And I said, well, what do you mean by the old songs? She's talking about, she said, in the garden and the old rugged cross and out of the ivory palaces. And I said, yes, Grandma, we do. We, we sing those old songs. She said, I love those old songs. And she began to tell me how that her grandfather was a preacher back in Kansas. He had gotten saved as an adult. He had a little general store out in the middle of nowhere and he was known for cheating people and being dishonest, but it was the only store for miles and miles around, so people still frequented his business. I don't know the details, but somehow he got gloriously saved, born again. 
couldn't quit telling people about Jesus. Started preaching himself. Started five churches there in Kansas, out in the middle of nowhere. Started a Bible college out there. His life just turned around completely. And my grandmother had heard his preaching. 75 years before she told me all of this. And she remembered the old songs. I would pray for her every single day, go see her, but she would not budge. She would not get saved. She would not acknowledge any of the truth that I was trying to give her and was very rude about it at times. I prayed for her, prayed for her, prayed for her, prayed for her. Finally, one day we got the word that she had had a stroke and by this time, Don and I were married and Justin and Christopher were born and uh, we'd go see her in the hospital and one day I just was beside myself with a burden for her to be saved. I walked into her hospital room and within about a minute or so, she said, Larry, she said, uh, do you believe uh, what um, the Bible, or no, she said, here's, that was another instance. She, she said, what does your church believe about Jesus compared to what my church believes about Jesus? Well, you could have knocked me over with a feather. She had never been willing to listen to anything. So I told her, and of course reminded her of what John 8, 24 says, if you believe not that I am he, he shall die in your sins. I said, Grandma, if you don't believe that Jesus is God in the flesh, then you can't get your sins forgiven. She did believe she was a sinner. I said, your sins are not forgiven and they will not be forgiven ever if you do not believe that Jesus is God in the flesh that came and died on a cross and paid for your sins. God is the only one that can forgive your sins. So if Jesus isn't God, your sins aren't forgiven. And she said, oh. And one of her sons, my dad, my, my grandma has seven boys, uh, no daughters. My um, dad and my uncles, not one of them ever ran away from home, but my grandma did. Two or three times. <laughs> she had seven boys, you know. And uh, so anyway, uh, she said, don't believe, I had one uncle that was involved in that same cult. And she told me in that hospital room, don't tell your uncle that I believe this. And I was like, Grandma, you believe this? And she, she said, well, just, just, let's just say that you've given me food for thought. To make a long story short, she was not ready and willing to get saved right that day. But shortly she did. And But here's the deal that I was reminded of. During the course of that conversation, she told me, she said, you know what I can't get out of my head the last two weeks? Picture this, she had had some strokes. She was in the hospital because of it. And she says, night and day, in my dreams at night and in my thoughts in the day, I still see my grandfather preaching. And at the end of his sermon, my grandmothers, two grandmothers, one on each side of her, would turn to me and in my ears would say, Ethel, come to Christ. Ethel, you must come to Christ. Ethel, you have to come to Christ. And she said, I also see my grandfather, she said, preaching to us around the kitchen table. And my grandmother and I sitting there listening. And when he was done, both my grandfather and my grandmother would come at me and say, Ethel, come to Christ. You must come to Christ. And she said, Larry, that scared me. She said, because I knew Jesus was in heaven and the only way to get to heaven was to die. And as a seven-year-old girl, that scared me to death. She said, I didn't want to die and go to heaven just then. And so she says, what does that mean, come to Christ? And I said, Grandma, 
That means you come to Jesus to get your sins forgiven and come to Him for the eternal life He's offering you freely by His grace because He died on the cross to pay for your sins, was buried and rose again to conquer death. And because He conquered death, you can conquer death and have your sins forgiven through His death on the cross. And so that's what it means to come to Christ. You come to Him and ask Him to forgive your sins and to give you eternal life. Amen. Putting your faith in Him and Him alone for that. And she goes, oh, I didn't know that's what it meant. And as I said, shortly she was saved. Shortly thereafter. But what I'm trying to say is, is that not only did these men not lose faith after asking one time and Jesus not answering their prayer. But they also had somebody that led them to Jesus the first time and the second time. Had to have had. They couldn't see. He wasn't talking. And so it's important for us, every one of us, to understand you don't just quit praying because you don't get your answer after one time of asking. Amen. And you don't quit interceding on behalf of other people to bring them to Christ and have a part in their salvation, even if you're not the one that leads them to the Lord, but you bring them to Christ by praying, 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 and not giving up on them, and not giving up on them, and not giving up on them. At that particular time, from the time I got saved until my grandmother uh, had received Christ as Savior, I prayed every day for 11 years. Now that's not the longest time that anybody's ever prayed for somebody to get saved. I'll guarantee you that. But it's important that we understand that God wants us to ask and keep asking and to seek and keep seeking. Amen. But then, as we see here, then Jesus tells them, see that no man know it. Don't tell anybody. But when they were departed, they spread abroad his fame in all that country. They couldn't keep quiet. They couldn't shut up. They were so elated, so thrilled with being um, uh, in, in a state of being able to see and, and have vision for the first time. And I have no doubt because they had the faith in Jesus as being a deliverer, as the Messiah, as Emmanuel, God in the flesh, as Jesus, um, which means uh, he shall save his people from their sins. That... As Jesus had this compassion on them and had this mercy on them and had His grace and love placed upon them and cared enough for them to, to go ahead and heal them, He still told them, don't tell anybody I did this. We go, what in the world? Um, why would He do that? Why would He say something like that? He came to seek and to save that which is lost. He wants the whole world to know that He is God in the flesh. He wants the whole world to know that He's got mercy for them, grace for them, love for them, forgiveness, eternal life. He wants the whole world to know that. If you keep in mind the context and how Jesus had been healing, 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 and miracle after miracle after miracle, and the crowds were getting bigger, and bigger and bigger that followed him through the streets of Capernaum. I believe that the truth of this is this, is that he didn't want people coming to him just to see a miracle performed, just to be healed physically. He wanted them to certainly know that he was God in the flesh, but he wanted to hear them to hear the message of salvation. He wanted them to hunger for that, not just to get some physical benefit from him and walk away, still lost, still going to hell. He wanted them to know the truth. He didn't want to be a wonder worker that people came because, you know, it's kind of like seeing... Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, fire. And a lot of people want to gravitate to fire. Uh, it's why a lot of people go to a hockey game. 
they go to a, a hockey game because they really, the way they put it, how many hockey fans in here? Anyway, anybody? All right, all right, a little bit, uh, Brother Dan. Most hockey fans go because they go to a fight and occasionally a hockey game breaks out, you know, and everything. They want to see that. A lot of folks, yes, do go see NASCAR and watch NASCAR on TV to see a race and they've got a favorite driver and all that sort of thing, but a lot go to see Rex, you know, some great um, uh, thrilling thing that happens that they can say they witnessed it and saw it. Jesus didn't want that. He didn't want the crowd coming around for that. He wanted them to know him personally and to know eternal life, to know God through him. So then we continue along the way here and it says, and as they went out of that house, verse 32, behold, they brought to him a dumb man possessed with the devil. And right away, dumb has nothing to do with his IQ. We we'll just spell that right away. It meant he couldn't talk. Another word we would mute, uh, use for it is the word mute. He could not speak. But then we go further and find out that he had been possessed with a devil and the, that demon that was within him literally occupying his body and controlling his thoughts, controlling his emotions, and just taking over this person had decided to wreak evil upon this person and the way he did it was to cause this person to be speechless to not be able to utter a word to not be able to say one word and so in that evil it says and when the devil was cast out verse 33 that jesus clearly uh, performed the dumb spake the person who could not speak spake immediately. And the multitudes that obviously were not only inside the house with him, but outside the house with Jesus, and followed him every step of the way, hoping to see again more miracles, more miracles, more miracles, they marveled. They were beside themselves, astonished. And it says they made this statement. It was never so seen in Israel. As a crowd, as a group, that's what was going through their collective minds and hearts. That we've never seen anything like this ever before. Well then, we understand. and by the way, this could very well apply. We are told before this in Matthew that Jesus had wrought many miracles, healed many people. But we don't have any recorded yet that he had healed anybody blind. So, and nor had he healed anybody that couldn't speak and caused them to speak. And so this marveling could be at the fact that they'd never seen anybody healed from blindness before. They'd never seen anybody healed from being mute or not being able to speak before. And they were beside themselves in astonishment, marveling at what Jesus did and what had just happened right before their eyes. But the Pharisees, the cold, uh, the uh, cold uh, uh, water bucket brigade, brigade the, the wet blanket brigade, had to come along and throw wet water on what had happened, saying, he casteth out devils through the prince of devils. That's how he does it. Well, this is interesting here. Because all of these miracles that he's been performing, including healing the two blind men and this, this man who couldn't speak, were indicative of the fact that he was God in the flesh. Undeniably so. They had to come up with some reason why these miracles were being performed. They had to take the attention off of Jesus and away from God and try to put it back on themselves because as Pharisees, they wanted the multitudes to follow them. They wanted the mul multitudes to marvel at them, but they couldn't do what Jesus did. They didn't have the authority over these diseases and over these maladies, these infirmities that Jesus did. They wanted all authority. They wanted all power. And they loved having power over people and authority over people and everything and controlling people. But by the way, when somebody is over controlling, 
they've crossed boundaries into areas that don't belong to them and want to control people in a way that they have no biblical um, uh, right to do. They're being like the devil. These Pharisees understand were reflecting in their own lives what the devil was doing to this mute man. It was the devil through his demon that was controlling this, this mute man's voice. He was, he was putting his power and his authority on this person, the devil was, to show that he could do that. And wanted the glory for it. Wanted the credit for it. And so they brought to him this man that was possessed of the devil or a demon. And Jesus showed that he had authority over the devil. Not just over his mute uh, condition, his uh, speechlessness. But that he had authority over Satan. And Satan couldn't stop him. I mean, Satan couldn't stop him. Satan couldn't keep him in the grave, could he? No. Oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? Blessed be God that giveth us the victory through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, glory to God. He's the reason that we rise from the grave, that we have eternal life, that to him that has Jesus, to, she that has, to her that has Jesus, um, he, he shall never die. Because to be absent with the body is to be present with the Lord. When you take your last breath here on earth and you know Jesus as your Savior, you don't miss another breath. Amen. Your next one's just taken right in the presence of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah, glory to God for that. Amen. Amen. But Jesus has control over the devil. You know, the devil is said to have the keys of death and hell. But when Jesus rose from the dead, he destroyed the last enemy, death itself, and jerked those keys of death and hell right out of the hands of the devil. He doesn't have them any longer. We find out that as we go through this, again, the Pharisees didn't like the fact that Jesus had cast out this demon and that had healed the blind men and their answer to the multitudes was ah, he's doing it by the power of Beelzebub he's doing it by the power of of the devils the prince of devils Satan himself trying to take the spotlight off of Jesus well they were determined that Jesus would not get glory they were jealous of his does that sound to you like anything that's going on in our day and age? Being told that you can't go to church. Being told that you can't sing as a body of believers. One of my granddaughters had a birthday recently. You know that my family has all 12 months of the year covered on birthdays. <laughs> All 12. <laughs> we are at birthday parties every month of the year, sometimes several months, uh, several in a month. Praise the Lord for that. I just, God's given us a bigger family that we just are grateful for. But um, we were at that birthday party the other day and they're getting ready to sing happy birthday. And I said, wait, hold it, hold it, hold it. You're not allowed to sing in California. So it stopped them for a second, but they were rebels. They sang anyway and sang happy birthday anyway. Uh, mark my word, as there are a lot of churches now and congregations that are standing up against some very unbiblical orders from our government, and unconstitutional orders from our government and holding church services. There are a few that are being singled out by our government. I told you about the one preacher that's being 
fined in Santa Clara County $50,000 a week for holding services. I've been doing so for several weeks now. There's others that are being sued and uh, having authorities come against them, threatening to lock their church, threatening to uh, bring great fines, threatening to lock their uh, to to lock their preacher up, put them in jail, and everything. And a lot of those preachers are standing up for Christ uh, to the government. But the government understand this: the more that they see God's people standing up, the more they see God's people as an impediment, as a, an obstacle to their agenda and to their goals. And the more they're going to single out God's people, the more they're going to come down even with more aggression and with more pressure and with more might to get their point across. And Christians will be the enemies. Christians will be the targets. You're the problem. And because Christians find our motivation in our relationship with Christ, then Christ is the target. When they find that we get our marching orders from the Word of God, then the Word of God will be the target, the Bible. And the more they will see that they feel they have to eliminate their opposition and those that come against them. So what I'm saying is this, is that know that you know that you know that you're saved, that you know Jesus as your Savior. That's so vitally important. Know that He is the Messiah, the Son of God, and don't let anybody or anything sway you on that truth. Don't let anybody keep you from acknowledging that and worshiping the Lord as you are commanded to do, as we are all commanded to do in the Word of God. Know that also that Jesus is going to be faithful and give you grace regarding anything that comes your way, any threats you receive, any backlash you get, any opposition or pushback that you get. God will give you the grace. And don't forget that his strength is made perfect in weakness. It's not our strength. It's His strength. And the truth of the matter is, He is our strength. He lives in every one of you. It's not my strength. I don't get it from me. I don't get it from anybody else. I don't get it from the area I live in. I get it from Jesus. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. With God, nothing is impossible. All things are possible with God. If thou canst believe, all things are possible. Mark 9, 23. We understand that these miracles did take place. That Jesus can and still does heal people. We understand that there will be opposition from the world, even in religious circles. Pharisees were extremely religious, the most religious people of their day. Don't be surprised when you hear on the news somebody, some man, some woman, in some religious circle or from some church um, stands up and begins to speak against Christians who are living for Jesus and following the tenets of their faith and being faithful to obey God rather than man. There will be people in religious circles go against that. They are not saved. They do not know Jesus. They don't know their Bible. So we know and understand by God's grace, we are here today to witness what is we've been uh, reading from the Word of God, to know that Jesus is still in the miracle working business and that the greatest miracle He's ever performed is to see someone born again. Jesus 
told Nicodemus in John chapter 3 and verse 3, unless you're born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. These men could not see, but they believed that Jesus was the Messiah. And they physically saw, and I believe spiritually saw, when they were healed. This man that could not speak was not just physically healed and was given his voice for the first time, but I believe also, spiritually speaking, he had a voice for Christ because he was now born again. He was now a believer that this Jesus was the Messiah. Intercede on the behalf of those that around you that don't know Jesus. And if you're here today and you do not know Jesus, understand we love you, but more importantly, God loves you and wants you to come to Jesus. As my grandmother was told when she was seven years old, Ethel, you need to come to Christ. Ethel, come to Christ. You must come to Christ. I'm here to tell you there is no heaven and no forgiveness of sins without coming to Christ. And depending on Him alone, nothing else. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes, please. And no one looking around. You're here today and you say, Pastor, God's speaking to my heart today and showing me that I need Jesus as my Savior.